um, I'm, I think we should have a fun evening. I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to thank Chairman Van Kipnis, who I just got to get to know, Katie DeLay, Brad DeVos, and Dr. Stringham. Uh, sometimes economists are like composers, and Ed is a kind of Mozart of economics. That's what I call him, Mozart. Each essay in Dr. Stringham's book, Private Governance, if you listen to it, is a piano sonata. Particularly chapter eight, private policing in California, reminds me, I'm not kidding, um, it's as elegant and neat as piano sonata 16. So I'll just throw that out there. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm a big fan. So, uh, Recently, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell made some remarks about the founder of the modern Fed, Mariner Eccles. Chairman Powell said of Chairman Eccles that Eccles had created a central bank able to make decisions in the long-term best interest of the economy without regard to political pressure. In addition, Chairman Powell said of Mariner Eccles that from my perspective as Fed Chair, he, Eccles, is responsible more than any other person for the fact that the United States today has an independent central bank, independent. And that's, the suggestion was is that's what a good fair, Fed chairman is, independent, responsible. Listen to the phrases, independent central bank, even more important, independent man. He is responsible. He is responsible. He is responsible. That's the d description you get of any Fed chair, and the point reflects received wisdom. Our nation's prosperity is based on men, women, um, responsible, wise, intelligent people, men or women, and the Fed can fend off a pushy president, can keep inflation down. A responsible man can make bold decisions that mean difference between smooth water and rough storm. What does a rough storm look like? Well, most of you know, but for the very youngest, I'll say a rough storm would be the 1970s. And you all know these data points, but I'll mention them again. Mortgage interest rates over 15%. Federal funds rate that peaked at 22.4. Joblessness, of course, well over 5%, sometimes past 10. Economy so lacking in confidence that it makes the United States itself lose confidence. So tonight my job is to tell you a story about an independent, responsible man. A man named Arthur Frank Burns. And you know him, but I'll still tell it, uh, some of you will remember, as it happened, uh, he served as Fed Chairman from 1970 to 1978. Um, and once you, you have heard or are reminded of Burns' story. You can form your own judgment about good men, their capacity to handle monetary storms, and their capacity to fend off pushy chief executives. It's a good story. It's a rather dramatic. It's a story, um, and I'm not stretching here, worthy of Sophocles, or at least particularly the Theban plays, in which, as you recall, the hero Oedipus tries to arrange his life to avoid tragedy, only to cause the very tragedy he labored so long to preclude. It's also a story that has echoes of policy today. Um, you'll hear them, but the telling takes a minute, and I'm grateful for your evening time. Before this uh, lecture, I asked, have they had a drink yet? <laughs> because there was alcohol, we decided against the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I want to remind you, um, sometimes we, we think of Burns differently, that at the time it seemed, uh, that would be the 60s, 70s, right, 50s, if ever a man seemed to display these necessary traits identified by Chairman Powell, it was Arthur Burns. We'll start with the independence part. You know that uh, Burns was born in Stanislaw, which was then in Austria, just after the turn of the century. He wasn't just intelligent, but he was super intelligent. And in a way, his intelligence was his passport to the United States. It's, it's an immigrant, Burns was, who didn't arrive so much as catapult in 
to the United States, astonishing teachers. At the age of six, he translated Talmud into Polish and Russian, or from Polish and Russian into English. At the age of nine, he debated free market capitalism, arguing naturally on the free market side. Um, an avid student, he zoomed through Columbia, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and then upped his already impressive tra trajectory with a doctorate from Columbia, and I've met some of his colleagues here tonight, a doctorate, it should be noted, uh, completed as the Keynesian revolution took hold. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't solid doctrine yet, right? Um, and even as a young man, Burns was recognized as one of the greatest economic talents around. Um, Wesley Mitchell, one of the founders of modern economics, sponsored him and promoted him in Burns's case, and I want you to recall this when we get to the material later, intelligence and independence seem to, to him syn synonyms. Are they? Intelligence and independence. Um, because he was so intelligent, Burns understood pre-Keynesian economics, he understood Keynesian economics, he, un he, uh, he decided that he believed that monetary and fiscal tools affect the inflation rate and the growth rate, okay. But he made himself a loud and public enemy of inflation. Um, that was, as he saw it, part of his intelligence. As a young man, um, he was very proud that he didn't go along with the rest. In the 50s and the 60s, when scholars were building what we now call Phillips Curves, Burns refused to concede the argument of the curve. He didn't want to concede there was a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, that, that the nation must have to pick between those two hazards. He was too shrewd to serve a curve, right? Uh, so when the trade-off was harder, hardening into doctrine, he actually published a book uh, in the 1950s whose very title refuted the Phillips Curve trade-off. It was called Prosperity Without Inflation. That's his work as a young man. He kept a distance from other doctrines. Um, uh, he was Austrian, born, but not Austrian. Right? Um, if you know what I mean. Um, he didn't have much to do with Mises or Friedrich von Hayek, and I learned tonight that he refrained from granting Anna Schwartz her well earned doctorate at Columbia University. That would be Anna Schwartz, Schwartz and Friedman. So he, he could be cruel. He, found, he thought himself too clever to be categorized. Other men might part their hair on the side. That became the fashion in the Mad Men era, not Arthur Burns. It just stayed right down the middle of the line. <laughs> Other men switched to cigarettes. Burns smoked a pipe all the way through. He went to the White House to serve as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in the 50s, and there he advertised his independence. Eisenhower's top economist prefers to speak for himself, read a 1954 headline. Others respected Burns' high opinion of himself because they happened to share it. As a young man, he was a wizard forecaster. It was said that he had the ability to forecast the strength of a recovery by the thickness of the smoke in the automobile dealerships of the Midwest. <laughs> And uh, one very special client appreciated Burns's talent in a big way. That client was Vice President Richard Nixon. In 1959 and 1960, the period when Nixon was running for US president, building up to war running, Burns muttered into the candidate's ear that the discount rate had to be lower, say 2%, not 4% for the incumbent party, that would be Nixon's party, to stay in power. Well, for whatever reason, John Kennedy became president and not Richard Nixon. And what Nixon would remember was that Burns had given him a priceless gift. If you think this story is about ego, it is. Burns had given Nixon a priceless gift. Nixon could blame his electoral loss on the Federal Reserve chairman. <laughs> it was that interest rate. William McChesney Martin, not himself, it's not his fault. And this, the result of this argument given to Nixon by Burns was an affection of Nixon for Burns that gave Burns a crucial in with Nixon. 
just want to say one or two things about that second characteristic Chairman Powell identified, which is responsibility. Burns looked responsible. Um, I told you about the part. Um, he was good to some students. You may know that Milton Friedman was his protege. So in a way, by the way, was Tom Sowell, Thomas Sowell, for whom Burns wrote a very strong recommendation to the University of Chicago's uh, doctoral program in economics, even though Sowell didn't always have the qual he didn't have a perfect portfolio for his application, and Sowell did get in. By the 1960s uh, time of our story, Burns was 60, older than 60, head of NBER, leader, even pope of economics in the United States. Responsibility also related to policy, and Burns had his personal how of how to get things done. But again, the goals he had stayed the same and were, were very virtuous. One was um, that inflation was bad, so it must be stopped. He always reminded Nixon he came from a place that became communist, and communist leaders, because of their political power, inflated the currency and killed democracy. He deplored measures that threatened monetary stability. He deplored wage and price controls. It had been his good fortune to live in the West as an immigrant, and he wanted to preserve the West by preserving the gold standard. Part of the strength of America, he understood, was our money. And remember, in Burns's era, the relevant law was the 1946 law, the Employment Act. The 1946 Employment Act, as many of you know, um, suggested that the government coordinate all its parts in a manner, open quote, calculated to foster and promote competitive enterprise and the general welfare, period, close quote. The 1946 Act does not say, and the Federal Reserve must inflate in order that there be more jobs. It's, it's kind of, it, you, it, it, it's, it's been interpreted in the courts, but it's also subject, you can hear the ambiguity in it, to interpretation. It, it, Therefore, what Burns wanted might have been possible. Um, it's, you know, that was before the more recent law, which we'll discuss later. In other words, um, Arthur Burns was perfect. When you get to 1960 and then 1968, the, the world in 1968 seemed to need an independent, responsible man especially badly. In the name of creating a great society, the subject of my book, Lyndon Johnson and Congress had increased domestic spending more dramatically than presidents in the past. Inflation was over 4% and heading towards 5 The Fed chairman at the time, when Nixon began to run, was perceived to be failing. Um, everyone knows the famous line about William McChesney Martin that he that he said the Fed chairman's job was to take the punch bowl away just when the party got going. Well, Martin did not take the punch bowl away, clearly. Um, he left the discount rate too low, too long. Um, the executive branch in Congress in 1968 were blaming inflation on war spending. It, it, the number of soldiers in Southeast Asia had increased tenfold in about a minute. And Burns, rare among economists, pointed out, even before he went to the White House, that it was the butter that was the trouble, not the guns. That when the war ended, he said, we will still have too much cost from all the entitlement commitments of your great society. Miracle of miracles, a new candidate, Richard Nixon, his friend, is running for president. Miracle of miracles, Nixon understands about inflation. Miracle of miracles, he calls Burns. He taps Burns. He remembers what Burns said about the 60 election. He respects Burns. And as their talks progress, the talks of a candidate who's about to win with an economist, Burns' hope only grows. This is because of a factor that has nothing to do with the quality of Nixon's policies as he represented them in 1968. The issue was Burns' vanity. And that is the vanity from which we all, to some extent, suffer, the academic vanity of liking other educated people because they make us feel comfortable. As very academic people, and that includes Nixon and certainly Burns, are uncomfortable around regular people. Um, and Nixon, unlike Johnson, was educated. Uh, to meet Nixon was a relief after meeting Johnson, who appeared to Burns a slob. And Nixon, another miracle, showed he respected Burns 
by giving Burns that one thing that intellectuals prize. He listened to Burns. <laughs> it helped Burns, he figured, that Nixon didn't even like economics. That meant Nixon would defer even more to Burns, who was older. After all, a president's respect is a narcotic, as someone just told me. And when Nixon did win in November, Burns ached all the more to satisfy Nixon and satisfy the country. What if Nixon brought Burns in to run the whole economy? What if Nixon made Burns Fed chairman the obvious thing? When William Martin retired in 1970, Nixon wouldn't dare push around someone as senior as Burns. Burns made a personal bet. If Burns could manage to stay by Nixon's side, if Nixon kept listening to Burns long enough, then Burns would repair the economy, protect the Fed independence, and save the gold standard. And Nixon was, after all, as he wrote delusionally in his diary, his best friend. That's the narcotic talking, right? Burns would spend his last professional years, years just before retirement, in the warm light of a reputation as a savior of the free world. Sidebar about human ambition. The younger people in the room will be thinking about Burns' age. He was over 60, as I mentioned. The tendency when we are young is to think that no one old can want a thing as badly as we do when we are young. Right? The young people have, but that's wrong. Young people have all the time in the world, not older people. Burns knew he could save the economy, but he couldn't wait until 1978 or 1982, could he, when he would be 74, 78? He had to do it now. He craved a reputation for prosperity, and he had to get it now. This was his last shot. And that kind of desperation is, unfortunately, a feature of us older, ambitious people, right? At first, in the Nixon administration, it all went swimmingly for Arthur. Nixon did have quirks. Um, he maintained a kind of Praetorian guard, two young campaign men, John Ehrlichman and Haldeman, right? And sometimes you had to go to them to get to the president. OK, Burns thought, I can handle that. And he did. He called them the boys, Haldeman and Ehrlichman. And the boys respected Burns, at least appeared to at first. And Nixon pulled Burns close. And Nixon tapped Burns for serious projects, such as studying the entire government and writing a report about how you could keep up with inflation in, in, with the wages of the public sector. And Burns wrote a big schematic with the early PowerPoint and the early Excel pages of all the salary raises that all the government employees would have to get to keep up with the inflation that they caused. Okay. In any new administration, there's a kind of sorting that occurs. And the wild figures who are popular and foremost in the campaign, the Steve Bannons, uh, sometimes lose out to the older, steadier hands who turn out to, to be rather devious sometimes. Um, that key victory also came to Burns. Um, another Nixon advisor, a happier, um, more lovable figure, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, was much loved by the president. And Moynihan was putting forward a great social democratic plan, an idea you haven't heard of lately called guaranteed income, <laughs> universal guaranteed income. Um, and Burns could see Nixon liked that idea for the votes. You get a lot of people on welfare. You get a lot of votes. And Burns determined to serve Nixon by warning him. And he uh, illuminated Nixon and showed him how many millions more people would effectively be going on welfare. And Burns, a data hound, which is what he was, marshaled his numbers. And Moynihan crunched numbers rather sloppily. Moynihan's strength was not data. And Burns definitely outcrunched him. And he pulled in his best subordinates to outcrunch Moynihan, including one Martin Anderson, who you may have encountered. And pulled out all the data and showed Nixon what an awful idea this guaranteed income was. And, and Nixon saw that Congress felt the same way. And in the end, Burns won. And Moynihan was shipped back to Cambridge. Uh, so that victory was there already for Burns. He was on the up. Nixon offered him treasury, which Burns declined. He wanted the Fed. Uh, but Burns gave Nixon kindly some names of some appropriate people, maybe from Wall Street, um, you know, who he thought would fit at the Treasury, which is less important than the Fed. And in addition, 
Um, he was happy, I, I'm sure, because William Martin had raised the interest rate to 6%, and maybe inflation was taken care of. How convenient. You come into the Fed and you don't have to battle inflation because your poor beleaguered predecessor did it for you. At um, Burn, the time of Burns' swearing in, Nixon made a joke. Uh, he cracked a joke about the independence of the Fed. He said that it was a myth. Well, Burns, uh, Burns told himself that was just a joke. He could train Nixon back into respect. The stage was set for Arthur Burns, Fed chairman, Arthur Burns, superstar. But a funny thing happened to Burns when he became Fed chairman. Suddenly, Nixon became unavailable. Instead of meeting, and Burns was a delicate you know, inquirer. You know, he sent all sorts of feelers about meetings with the president. Instead of meeting, Nixon sent men to see Burns, the very boys for whom Burns had so little respect. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, who were they? they were the, and they were the president's messengers. Add insult to injury, they scolded Burns. Ehrlichman uh, later, in his memoirs, wrote, wrote down the script for one of these meetings with Burns when they took him to the woodshed. OK, you ready? So Ed's going to be Arthur. The president made you chairman of the Fed. Jay, oops, I mean Arthur. I mean, Ed, the president made you chairman of the Fed, Arthur. You are deeply in his debt, Arthur. Come along and join us on our policy. Stop talking independently. The president expects you to be loyal. What's going on? This blocking um, wasn't necessarily because of any change in Arthur. It was because of a change in Richard Nixon. The Nixon of 70 and 71 was not the same president-elect, the intellectual who flattered Burns into joining the administration in 68. In 78, Nixon was an incumbent president running for office with less than two years to go. Uh, Nick, this new Nixon wanted two things, which all presidents seeking a second term want. He wanted the Fed to lower interest rates, or at least not raise them. And he wanted Burns to stop his famous independent rambling speeches. So the administration, including the Fed, would speak with one voice. Well, Burns thought that was offensive. And he thought he could get past these Nixon ideas and Haldeman and Ehrlichman. But then Nixon did something unexpected, well, unexpected to Arthur Burns. Rather than accept Burns' sage recommendations for Treasury Secretary and take some harmless fellow from Wall Street, Nixon selected his own Treasury Secretary, not an NBER scholar, not a Wall Streeter, not even a Republican, a Democrat, John Connolly, a kind of puffed up version of Lyndon Johnson, John Connolly of Texas. Connolly was afraid of no man. He told the Europeans, Burns' friends, whatever he felt like telling them. For example, they were having a little trouble with the gold going out in 1971. Connolly promised the Europeans America would never raise the price of gold, devalue, close the gold window, none of that. Wait a minute, said a little staffer, or actually a very tall staffer who worked for Connolly named Paul Volcker. Um, the, the Europeans are withdrawing gold. We may have to do something about the gold price or the gold window. Oh, that doesn't matter. I don't care, said Connolly. It's a good thing to say. <laughs> and Connolly hurt to insult to injury. Connolly made it clear he didn't want to listen to any Arthur Burns. Connolly wanted Burns to go along with his policy, which he would set. Um, so what, what the end of the story is what could be called Burns agonistes. Burns didn't want to give up. He didn't want to lower interest rates or even keep them low. And Nixon kept avoiding him. How could he see the president? He knew he, in his heart that if he could explain it all to Richard, to Dick, then it, everything would be fixed. But he just still wasn't getting access. One of the ways he could see the president was to attend church service at the White House. You could go on Sundays. Great, very important. So Burns did attend when he could. One weekend in 1971, he planned to attend. But Nixon ordered Burns stricken from the church list. <coughs> oh, Burns somehow managed to get into the 
service anyhow and beg for attention, and the president rebuffed him. Why does Arthur need to see me? Nixon asked the men. He says we don't understand him, said George Schultz of the Office of Management and Budget. Schultz had already become uh, the Nixon whisperer at this point. He feels the White House pushes him too hard. Nixon told his men he would see Burns after some scheduled testimony by Burns. Wait and see if Burns behaved. Burns continued to play for time. Because raising the interest rate would be a provocation, even though inflation was strong, he fiddled around with his version of QEs, subtle, with the money supply in various ways, provoking the first big public criticism of the Fed chairman from, of all people, his own student, Milton Friedman. But for Nixon, Burns' actions were never enough. Even as he dispatched deputies to work his mischief, Nixon rambled on to whoever would listen about the disloyalty of Arthur and people like Arthur. The, the president thought Jews were the problem. They would lose him the election. The government is full of Jews, Nixon told Haldeman. Jews are disloyal. He might be able to trust Kissinger. He might be able to trust Sapphire. But the rest of them, they were a Jewish cabal. <laughs> They work with people like Burns, and they all only talk to each other, only Jews. In Burns' case, this was hardly so. The one person Arthur Burns wanted to talk to was Richard Nixon. Right? Some politicians have a cruel street, and Nixon it was one. Cruel politicians like to watch their employees fight, like a cockfight. Right? Think of Chris Christie. They like to watch their employees get up to mischief. Nixon enjoyed watching his staff fight over turf, and he also participated in torture. No question about it. I'll read you some more of Nixon. It's almost painful. It's so awful. Connolly doesn't really like Jews, Nixon said. People like Burns. Well, that's too bad. Too bad for Burns, right? They're just going to have to take it. In the summer of 1971, when Burns was still not going along and reducing the interest rate, Connolly and Nixon played a trick on Burns. They decided they would plan a story about how it was time for the Fed to be integrated into the Treasury. Hmm. No more fourth branch of government, no more 1946 law ambiguity, no more Employment Act. And in order to disable Burns and discredit him, they would do something else. They would take that old notional salary increase Burns had proposed because the Fed had been included in this government-wide survey of how much wages would have to go up. And they would twist it so that it became a lie. They would say that Burns had asked for a 50% raise now. Can you imagine a Fed chairman who would do that? And they would feed this lie along with the idea that it was time for the Treasury to absorb the Fed to the Wall Street Journal. Well, this story duly appeared in the Wall Street Journal. White House wants to end Fed independence. Greedy Fed chair asks for 50% raise. Mm. Nixon and Connolly chortled over this trick. We know from the tapes, Nixon told Connolly, your little tactic you suggested got home to our friends across the street. That would be Congress. In Congress, Wright Patman, the populist, a fellow Texan of Connolly's, reacted with satisfying predictability, assailing the Fed. Patman, Nixon noted, stepped up to it right nice. Connolly vowed he'd tell no one that they'd pulled this trick. I'll play it dumb, said Connolly. So Burns is by now, summer of 1971, beside himself, like a torture victim, recovering in his cell after a session. Right. And Nixon still had a goal. He and Connolly wanted a package that would guarantee the appearance of prosperity for the 15 months remaining before the election. This package was practically Peronist. It was worthy of Juan Peron. It included projects the free market Burns was supposed to hate. Outright wage and price controls, not just government suggestions, tariffs, closing the gold window, devaluation maybe. Foreigners would no longer be able to, foreign governments, to withdraw gold from the US. There'd be no more humiliating run on the dollar. When I explain the role of gold to, um, in the American mind to very young people, sometimes I will mention the Bitcoin. I don't mean to offend you. Because even those of us who doubt the Bitcoin can concede one thing is true about it, which is that is a measure of distrust in a sovereign currency. <coughs> 
right? And gold's price on the free market at that time was above the official $35 price. And that spread was the quantification of the world's distrust in the great society dollar. That spread. If you close the gold window, this irritating, embarrassing spot on your tablecloth disappeared, right? In gold, right? Um, Nixon, though, needed something to complete his plan. He needed all his team to sign on if the package was to be received by the country. I told you Burns was a torture vict victim, and he was ripe to confess. Nixon and his gladiator, Connolly, took the next step, and they did the thing that torturers always do. He switched to the soft treatment to get the final confession of the soft treatment for this particular prison prisoner, and I would call him that, was the trip to Camp David with the rest of the economic team, the famous trip in August 1971. Treat Burns like the royalty he is, get him to go along, remind him of the perks of giving in to this strange plan. Burns got the perks. He, he got to go in the presidential helicopter. He got a special Camp David blazer with his name on it. <laughs> he got tumblers, little glasses that said Camp David. <laughs> the others were also there. You know who they were, Paul Volcker, Pete Peterson, many other names, George Schultz. They got blazers, but Burns was the only one to get the glass tumblers. <laughs> and of course, they all got something better than that. I don't want to be too hard on George Schultz, um, who was protesting all the way, but they got something better than that. They got the feeling they were included, that the president was listening to them again, that they would be included when? In the next term. The next five years, they were like Olympians, gods, writing new economic policy alone with the president at his special retreat. Burns should have opposed this package. Uh, to his credit, again, like kind of like a torture victim in a television show, Burns made a show of fighting. The item he chose to fight on was closing the gold window. Uh, he got uh, an evening with, with the president where he sang his heart out about the gold window. Paul McCracken describes it. Um, he told Nixon the Russians would make fun of them closing the gold window. Our market would crash, he told Nixon. Pravda would say America abandoned capitalism by closing the gold window. Well, Nixon said, Burns could count on the end of capitalism anyhow if the Republican Party didn't stay in power in 1972. This will be the last conservative administration in Washington, Burns, Arthur. Um, Nixon said at one point later. So Burns gave in on the gold standard, just as Nixon knew he would. He, Burns traded policy for his career and to win the affection of a president. And by the end, Burns was so befuddled that all he wanted was the appearance of respect, his own self-respect and that of others. He managed to convince himself he liked this package. Uh, and you may have read that he told William Sapphire, I argued pretty strenuously against the gold move. But that's the only difference I have with the whole policy. And even on that, I don't feel so cocky. Nobody can be sure when it was decided I told the president he would have my wholehearted support. The president told the other men that Arthur Burns was a fine man. The policy worked for a minute. Just like any Latin leader or Soviet leader, Nixon won the election. The policies held long enough for Nixon to win the election. But that's about it. It broke Burns forever. Burns continued to trade away principle for affection again and again for the monitor, and it broke the economy, as you know. Um, for the monetarist in the room, the monetary measure grew 6.8% in 1971 and 7.56% in 72. <clears throat> the discount rate went from 6% around the times Burns took office or just before to 4.5%. It went even lower. The Fed funds rate went down by four percentage points, and the predicted happened. Just what Milton Friedman said, the teapot exploded. Um, Burns had always argued, as we discussed, that the Phillips curve was wrong, that you could have prosperity employment without inflation. In the 70s, we got the proof the Phillips curve was wrong, but not in the way Burns hoped, because we had malaise and inflation, right? Neither prosperity. Um, nor, nor stable money, the, the horrible inverse. This is the period in which Colonel Harwood was advising his clients to buy gold mining shares. Um, the gold price rose at first. As you know, it didn't soar at first, but eventually it did. The Greek tragedy was complete. What Burns had warned against, Burns had caused. 
I'll close by asking just a couple of questions. What does this tell us? First of all, there is no such thing as a responsible man. Even the most responsible of men will be irresponsible in office when pressured by the chief executive under the narcotic. And though this speech is about Burns, it could also be about all other economists who go to Camp David. Um, it's difficult for them, even good free market economists. It could also be um, a, a nicer man, but nonetheless, Burns' predecessor, William Martin, a real gentleman, highly responsible, independent. The one Fed chairman who comes to mind as a possible exception is Paul Volcker. And Volcker did raise interest rates, even when it was unpopular. But what, was Volcker really independent? This is the controversial question. Carter and Reagan, unlike Nixon, particularly Reagan, actually supported Chairman Volcker. And even more important, as Alan Greenspan notes um, in his book, which is, is, uh, is a very insightful line about this, there was no gold standard anymore when Volcker was Fed chair. But Volcker lashed himself to the mast of the gold standard as if it still existed, figuratively. When you watched Volcker, you had the impression that he was following a gold standard. Um, as pu purists or pure, or you may disagree, but Volcker was following a rule um, or trying to when he was doing what he was doing. Sometimes there is independence in adherence to a rule, dependence on a principle. Intellect, that's true intellectual uh, independence, in my view. The final takeaway is that the system is what mattered, and it broke too. Remember, Burns had that 1946 law to contend with, which didn't really spell out what the Fed must do. Our law changed subsequent to that. Rather than correct the error that had occurred in the 60s and the 70s, Congress codified it in the Humphrey Hawkins Law of 1978 with its two goals of uh, stable money and high employment, the so-called dual mandate, and that mandate it says, as you know, has to be achieved with co through coordination among President, Congress, and Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Under Humphrey Hawkins, Fed chairmen have a harder time than Burns not caving in to a president. Um, finally, one has to ask, uh, Colonel Harwood saw what was happening. Not a lot of other people did. What allows this kind of foul folly to go unperceived as it occurs? Um, the answer is simple, a time lag. It was only five years later that most of the country realized what we had done collectively at Camp David in August 71. An intervening period of months or years obscures causality, just the way billows from Arthur's pipe obscured from the rest of us and him what he was doing. An intervening time permits denial. When the time lag ends, the reality comes. There was once a wise economist who explained this way back in the 50s. He said, inflation might be denied for a moment, but in the end, the problems of inflation will return to haunt us. And the name of that wise economist, ladies and gentlemen, was Arthur Frank Burns. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much.